If you are into creative web development or even just design trends in general, you have likely seen this rectangle glass style popping up everywhere lately. I kept noticing it on Twitter. People sharing experiments, Figma mockups, wallpapers, and even websites using this distorted glass aesthetic. It actually reminded me a few months ago, some of the pro members had reached out asking if I could cover this effect. And just recently, I came across this really cool shader on Shader Toy that simulates a similar fractal glass distortion. So I thought, why not try adapting it for the web? So last week, I put together this landing page concept using this technique. It features a full screen fractal glass background with subtle parallax motion that responds to your mouse. In this video, I'll walk you through how to build this exact look step by step. We'll use a full screen WebGL plane rendered with 3JS and apply a custom fragment shader to distort the UV coordinates of an image. The distortion itself combines a horizontal fractal stripe pattern with mouse based parallax movement, creating this dynamic glass like warping effect that reacts in real time. And I've made it fully configurable so you can tweak the number of stripes, the parallax strength, distortion intensity, and more. If you find the video helpful, make sure you leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you'd like to access the source code for this project, along with hundreds of other similar micro projects and a brand new website template every month, you can check out the pro membership via the link in the description. I've also created a Next.js version of this project, which is available to pro members only. All right, let's jump into the code. Let's start by setting up the basic HTML structure for the layout. First, we'll create a nav element that stays fixed to the top of the page. This will hold the main logo on the left and a few navigation links on the right. These are just placeholder labels for now, but they help set the visual tone. Next, we'll add the main hero section. This is where the actual fractal class shader will live. So we'll create a section with the class hero. Inside that, we'll add an image tag with an ID, glass texture. This is the image that will pass into the shader later as a texture. But for now, it's just sitting in the DOM and will be hidden using CSS. And finally, we have a div with the class hero content, which is absolutely positioned at the bottom of the hero section. Inside the container, there is a heading element with some placeholder text and below that, a paragraph element containing a short line of dummy copy. This gives us a simple but solid HTML structure to build on. All right, next, we'll jump into the CSS and start styling everything. First, I'm importing the Mentor font from Google Fonts. This is going to be our primary typeface across the entire layout. Clean, modern, and super readable. Then, I'll set up a quick global reset. We are removing all default spacing, that means margins and paddings, and setting everything to use border box sizing. That just gives us a more consistent and predictable foundation to build upon. Next, I'm applying Mandrop as the default font across the page. For the overall layout, I'll set the background color to black and text color to white. Now for the headings, I'm giving all H1 elements a large, bold style with slightly reduced letter spacing. Then for all anchor tags and paragraph elements, I'm styling them to match. They are white, clean, and uniform in size with no text decoration. Next, we'll style the navigation. The nav element is fixed at the top of the screen and stretches across the entire width. We give it some internal spacing and use flexbox to space out the logo and the links evenly. The alignment is set toward the top. The group of nav links is also styled using flexbox with a small gap between each link to keep it visually clean. Now onto the main hero section. The hero is set to fill the entire viewport and is positioned relative so we can absolutely position elements inside it. Inside the hero, we have got our image with the ID class texture. The image is hidden from the view. It's only used as a data source for our shader, not something we display directly on the page. Then there is the hero content, the text block that sits above the canvas. It's absolutely positioned near the bottom left of the screen and stretches across the full width. We are using Flexbox again to space out the heading and the small caption. The heading inside this section is set to take up a limited width just to balance things out visually. Finally, we add a quick media query to make the layout responsive. On smaller screens, we stack the content vertically and reverse the order, so the caption appears above the heading. We also increase the heading width so that everything fits neatly and maintains its readability across devices. And that's it for the CSS. We have now got a clean, responsive layout where everything is positioned exactly where we need it before bringing in the shader logic. Next, we'll start wiring up the WebGL canvas and load in our image texture using 3.js. 
Before we jump into the JavaScript setup, I want to quickly walk you through the shaders we are using for this effect. And just to be clear, like I've said it in many of the past videos, I don't have any experience writing GLSL code from scratch myself. In this case, I actually found a cool example on Shader Toy that had this sort of fractal glass distortion look. So I took that base idea and asked Claude to help me convert it into usable vertex and fragment shaders with a few adjustments including a parallax movement so it would work for a full screen landing experience like this. It took a bit of trial and error to get it behaving the way I wanted but I'll walk you through both shaders real quick just to give you an overview of what's happening. First up is the vertex shader. This one is pretty straightforward. All it's doing is passing the UV coordinates from the geometry to the fragment shader. We store those in a varying and then calculate the final screen position of the vertex using the standard projection and model view matrices. There is no distortion or animation logic here. It's just setting up the base data we need for the next step. Then we have the fragment shader and this is where everything happens. At the top, we have got a bunch of uniforms. These are dynamic values we'll send in from JavaScript like the screen resolution, texture size, mouse position, parallax strength, distortion factors and so on. Then the logic starts with a helper that just ensures the image scales properly to fill the screen, kind of like CSS background size cover. It adjusts the UVs so we never get any stretching or cropping. Then we have a function called displacement which calculates a small offset based on horizontal stripes that's used inside another function called fractal glass which loops over those displacements and averages them out to create that irregular fractal distortion across the x-axis. After that, we have a smoothing function for the edges. This one gently fades the distortion as we get closer to the sides of the screen. Now inside the main function, we start by storing the original UV position, then applying the fractal distortion on the X value. We blend the distortion using the edge factor, so it's stronger in the middle and fades out near the sides. Then comes the parallax logic. We calculate how far off center the mouse is and use that to shift the UVs horizontally with a bit of extra push if the distortion in that area is more intense. That's what gives the whole thing that layered classy depth effect that moves as you interact. That's a high level overview of what these two shaders are doing. Don't worry if the math isn't fully clear. The goal here isn't to write shader from scratch, but to understand how it blends the image in response to mouse movement and screen space. Now that we have got that in place, let's move into the JavaScript and I'll show you how to wire all this up with 3.js. We'll begin by bringing in the tools we need. We are importing 3.js, which is the library we'll use to create and render everything in WebGL. We're also importing the two shaders we just walked through the vertex shader and the fragment shader. These two are going to power the actual distortion effect on the image and we'll be connecting them to a custom material in just a bit. Next, we have set up a configuration object. This is basically a group of variables that define how the effect behaves. It includes values like how quickly the mouse should react when it moves, how strong the parallax effect should feel, how intense the distortion should look, and how many stripe patterns we want in the glass. Think of it as the control center. If you ever want to adjust how the glass behaves or reacts, this is the place you'll tweak. Keeping these values in one object just makes sure everything is cleaner and easier to maintain. After that, we reference a few HTML elements. We grab the hero section, that's the full screen area we created earlier. This is where we'll insert the canvas, the actual surface where 3JS will render everything. We also grab the hidden image we added earlier. This image won't shown directly on the page. Instead, we'll pass it into the shader as a texture so it can be distorted and animated on the GPU. Now we start setting up the actual 3D environment. First, we create a scene. This is just a container. It holds all the objects we want to render. Think of it as an empty stage. Then we set up the camera, but not the usual kind. Instead of using a perspective camera, we are using something called orthographic camera. The difference is that an orthographic camera doesn't have any depth perspective. It renders everything flat. Without that, the zoomed in or zoomed out feeling that you'd get in a 3D game. This is perfect for us because we are working with a flat full screen distortion. We want our image to behave like a 2D surface. Next, we'll initialize the renderer. This is what takes our scene and camera and draws them to the screen as pixels using WebGL. We enable anti-aliasing to smooth out edges and make sure result looks cleaner. Then we tell the renderer to match the size of the browser window and we adjust the pixel ratio to make sure it stays sharp even on high resolution displays but without going overboard and causing performance issues. Once that's ready, we add the canvas to the page by injecting it into the hero section. At this point, we have got a working WebGL canvas attached to the DOM ready to render whatever we place inside. 
Now we set up mouse tracking. We define two objects to track mouse position. One holds the current position and the other holds the target position. Both of these start in the center of the screen. Later, whenever the user moves their mouse, we'll update the target position and then we'll smoothly ease the current position toward that target over time so the motion feels fluid instead of jumpy. To handle that easing, we also set up a small helper function that interpolates between two values. This lets us animate the movement smoothly from the current state to the desired state on every frame. Next, we set up the shader material. But before we can do that, we need to define the size of the image we are going to use. So we create a placeholder that stores the image dimensions. We'll fill that in once the image is fully loaded. Then we create a new shader material using 3.js. This is the key step where we tell the GPU, use these shaders and here are the variables we want to send in. We pass in a bunch of uniforms. These are the values that shaders can access. We send in the image texture, the current screen size, the original dimensions of the image, the current mouse position, and all the custom config values we defined earlier. We also connect the vertex shader and the fragment shader we wrote earlier, so the GPU knows exactly what code to run. Finally, we build the actual mesh. We create a full screen plane, basically a flat rectangle that fills the entire screen. Then we apply the shader material we just created to that plane. This gives us a single visual object, a full screen mesh that takes in the image, distorts it using our shader logic and updates based on the mouse position. We add this mesh to the scene and now everything is ready to render. That wraps up the full setup for the FGL canvas, the shaders and the base distortion effect. In the next step, we'll handle loading the image into the shader, listening for mouse movement and kicking off the animation loop. Now that we have set up the scene, the shader and the mesh, let's take care of a few final pieces that bring everything to life. First, we need to load the image. Remember that hidden image we added earlier in the HTML? We are now going to use that image as a texture in the shader. But before we do anything with it, we need to make sure it's fully loaded into the browser. So we check whether the image is ready. And if it's not, we wait until it finishes loading. Once the image is available, we create a texture from it and tell 3JS that it needs to be updated. We also grab the image's original width and height and pass those into the shader. This helps the shader calculate the proper scale. So the image fills the screen cleanly without stretching or distortion. At this point, the shader has everything it needs, the image data, the resolution, and the distortion controls. Next, we track the mouse movement. We add an event listener to the window that watches for mouse movements. Whenever the user moves their mouse, we update the target position based on the current cursor location. We normalize the value so they stay between 0 and 1 with the top left corner being 0 and the bottom right being 1. We also flip the vertical axis so that it aligns properly with the shader's coordinate system. This ensures the movement feels intuitive. When you move your mouse up, the distortion moves in the right direction. After that, we make the whole effect responsive, we listen for when the browser window is resized, and when that happens, we update the canvas size to match. We also update the resolution uniform in the shader, so it always knows the current screen dimensions. This means, no matter what device you are on, or if you resize the window, the effect will stay perfectly aligned and properly scaled. Finally, we kick off the animation loop. We create a function that runs on every frame, and inside that, we smoothly animate the current mouse position toward the target mouse position using that lerp function we defined earlier. This is what gives the parallax movement that smooth, trailing feel. Instead of snapping instantly to the cursor, the distortion gradually catches up which makes it feel more fluid and intentional. Once the mouse position is updated, we pass it into the shader, then we tell the renderer to draw the scene using the updated values. This loop runs continuously, so the image keeps warping and reacting in real time as the user moves their mouse. And that's it. The effect is now fully functional. We have got a full screen glass distortion that reacts to the mouse, scales properly to the screen, and runs smoothly using a custom shader on the GPU. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.